Confidence Series, a clear perspective on partial dentures. It is being presented by Tremaine Watkins, CDT, Clinical Director of Guided Surgery and Implant Solutions. So I'll just introduce again Tremaine Wat Watkins. He is a clinical director here. He has served um, educating our audience, both and surgeons, clinicians, and office staff um, from dentistry A to Z. And we're very delighted that he's participating in our virtual webinar series here for you residents. So with that, I get to say, take it away, Tremaine. Thanks, Jessica. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining in. I appreciate the, your time and uh, look forward to talking about partial dentures. So let's let's dig in. So I wanted to start off by saying that I found these two. I was doing quite a bit of research on this because I want to make sure I had, for me, partials have often been tribal knowledge, and I wanted to make sure I had some good scientific sources. So if anybody's interested in getting this uh, information, please reach out. Happy to share it with you. I do know that both of these are, the authors have made them available to folks. So you're like, why are we talking about partial dentures in 2023? It's kind of funny. This is the conversation our team was having before we launched this. And I mean, I think most of us would say that with root form implants, we have uh, a very predictable solution for replacing missing teeth. Um, when I was younger, there were lots of times where it was difficult to do anything but a partial denture, but uh, now we can pretty much, with uh, predictable grafting procedures, get an implant in any position. And truthfully, an implant solution is usually superior to a partial denture. Uh, they'll be more comfortable, uh, they're of course much more stable, um, and they tend to help uh, retain hard and soft tissue. Obviously, uh, expense is different between partials and implants. And I think part of the challenge in clinical dentistry uh, more than ever is that our, our patients are somewhat educated, you might say. They're YouTube educated. And our, what we need to do is make sure that we understand the treatments that we're providing to the extent that we can uh, deliver, we can explain the value that we're delivering to our patients. Um, but there are going to be patients who either for technical or financial reasons choose partial dentures and there's still a very viable and more a very proven solution so we're going to talk about like how you decide which partial might be best and kind of different the kennedy classifications and how that helps us design our partial dentures so Somebody did a study, and I don't know how they figured this out, but there are 65,000 possible combinations of teeth and edentulous spaces. Um, and so Dr. Kennedy came up with a system in 1923, and it was updated by Dr. Applegate in 1954, to kind of talk about how we can group different oral situations so that we'll have strategies that we can apply to each patient that we actually see. So we're going to talk a little bit about the Kennedy classifications first on this slide, and then the Applegate rules, which help us kind of apply these even more broadly. So uh, again, Kennedy class one cases have bilateral free ends. Um, these are cases that have some intrinsic movement built into them, and, um, and that we're trying to control that movement as much as possible. Uh, Kennedy class two only has one free end, uh, and they have kind of an axis of rotation that we need to get a hold of. Um, so like in this case, between number six and say 14, we have a, an axis across which our partial can rotate. Kennedy class three are probably our most stable cases. With these, we wanna make sure that we can get a restoration that is very solid. And class four cases are, um, it's usually not that difficult to get uh, stability, but there are a lot of aesthetic challenges with the Kennedy class four, and sometimes we're gonna be using different materials so that way our patients get a more uh, aesthetic result. Um, why don't I go through these real quick just so we can talk about them? Um, and some of these seem a little bit self-explanatory, but I think it's one of those things if you're trying to learn a classification system, you have to understand the scope of it. 
So rule number one is classification should follow extraction. So we want to look at our cases after the teeth are um, in their stable configuration. Um, and I think two, three, and four basically just talk about we want to look at teeth that affect our partial. So in other words, if we're not replacing third molars, then we don't consider them. And we'll, we'll see a case where that applies. Um, if we're using the third molars for support, then they're considering the classification. So that may be the difference between a case being a class three and, and a class two or one. Um, same thing with second molars. And uh, rule number five is very helpful because a lot of times you'll have cases where you would have a variety of edential series and you're like, what class is this? Because the posterior spaces have the most effect on stability, we classify by the most posterior edentulous regions. Um, and we call the other spaces modification spaces. Uh, we don't have to worry about the size of the modification spaces. In other words, if it's one teeth, tooth, or four teeth, but just that it's um, that it's uh, how many there are. And then last but not least, uh, there are no modification spaces on a class four teeth. So how do we use this? So here's a case that's an example. We're going to assume that because these are models that all are um, all our extractions are already done. So looking at the um, maxilla, we've already applied Applegate rule one. Um, we're missing tooth number two. And since we're not going to restore it with an implant or whatever, uh, it's changed our Kennedy classification from a class two to class one. Um, and we're, we've changed from a class two to a class one because of that missing space right there, number two. Um, and looking at our mandibular arch, um, we could see that um, that our teeth again are missing, uh, which is obvious. But uh, it, you might look at this and say it's a Kennedy class four case. Um, but we, when we apply rule number five, we realize we classify by the most uh, the most distal segment. So the anterior missing teeth are actually a modification space. And this is a Kennedy class one. Again, this isn't just an exercise in academics, but it's that <clears throat> if this were a Kennedy class four, it'd be fairly stable, but it's a Kennedy class one. We're going to have to deal with the movement that's intrinsic in both these arches with a uh, with bilateral posterior extension. We can talk about the, um, the basic components of a partial denture. Um, and uh, I, I know this will be review for you guys, so we'll just go through it quickly. Uh, the major connector connects all the components of the partial denture, see here. And its primary function are connection and rigidity of the prosthesis. We want that component to be as rigid as possible. The minor connectors connect the other components of the partial for the major connect to the major connector, and we need those to be rigid as well. One of the things we want to look at is as few minor connectors as possible for hygiene, and, um, and we want to kind of get our minor connectors to do double duty. If we can use them as a um, as an indirect retainer like a guide plane, so much the better. Direct retainer is obviously very important to a partial, otherwise known as a clasp assembly. Um, <clears throat> they provide resistance to dislodging forces, usually consists of a rest, a retentive arm, a bracing arm, and a minor connector. Um, an indirect retainer resists movement of the partial away from the residual ridge. In other words, you might say flipping or tipping. So in this case, D, um, we have an axis of rotation here from number two to number 12, and D prevents the saddle from tipping downwards. Most of the time, you're not going to have um, an, a class with an indirect retainer. And denture bases are, after all, kind of the reason that we make the partial. It provides the patient with teeth that they can uh, function on that would not for them. Today, there are two ways we can make a, a framework for the partial denture, analog or digital. Um, 
So our left-hand image, which I don't remember where I found this, but this is a pretty cool image, uh, shows a person actually designing a partial framework. And the right-hand image shows a three-shoot design of a partial denture. Um, both methods are effective. And both methods, I would say at this stage, are proven. But the analog method can be very time consuming. And there are a couple steps during the process where, especially for a metal framework, where you can lose the whole frame and you get to start all over again. Um, digital equipment, especially metal printing technology currently is, can be quite expensive. But uh, I would say the best way to do this uh, today is with digital design and 3D printing. Um, in our laboratories, we do 3D printing, milling, injection, hot and cold processing. Um, but a lot of times, even with traditional processing these days, we're combining it with uh, some digital processes. So maybe we'll design and print the framework like you see on the right and then invest in cast it, turn it into a metal or invest and inject it to make a clear frame. So um, you'll see more and more of this. I imagine within your career, will be like Crown and Bridges, 90% digital and 10% uh, analog. But um, I think we'll, we'll see, uh, we'll talk about which processes. Um, there are a few digital only uh, products that you can offer these days, uh, but it's not quite the same as Crown and Bridge where everything's moved so far to digital. On the removable side, we're still seeing um, more early adopters that are using that. So surveying a partial denture, we'll talk about the analog process because the digital, the digital process with this is modeled on the analog process. If you, want to, if you think about it, a partial denture is essentially a bridge that sits on every tooth of the mouth. So for that reason, there's usually, in the morphology of teeth, recession, the like, there's usually a lot of undercuts that we need to block out. And the other thing we want to think about is just like if you're prepping a three in a bridge, you've got to think about path of draw. When you're doing a partial, you have to think about path of draw. And it not only is important for the fabrication of partial, but it's also important for the patient. However, we survey the partial, that's the way that the patient will uh, put the, take the partial in and out in their mouths. So, um, we want to make sure that when we're doing the survey, that the partial sits, the occlusal plane of the partial sits more or less parallel to the bench. The reason is I'll give a nice straight path of insertion. Every once in a while, we'll want to tip the anterior segment a little bit um, higher, um, which is still a comfortable path of insertion for the patient. You usually don't want to set the posterior teeth higher than the anterior because it's very difficult to get. A partial like that in where you have to seat the um, you have to seat the posterior first. Um, sometimes subtle distinctions can make a big difference in how the partial is inserted. So um, so you want to you want to kind of balance your uh, your survey. And what you'll find is that once you set up the uh, your your model in the surveyor, you'll be making marks that show the height of contour for each tooth. And you want this to be balanced cross arch as much as possible. Um, this is a very ideal, obviously it's just a graphic, but this is a very ideal case where the height of contour is in the middle to the lower third of the tooth and, um, and it's symmetric. Uh, that, that's uh, most ideal when you're doing your survey. And if you're doing digital, same thing, you turn the model in the screen so that you can see the direction of insertion and then the software will block it out for you. So whether your lab is de designing the partial and you're checking it, or you're actually designing the partial through your laboratory, uh, you wanna evaluate your partial design based on these criteria. Retention, um, you wanna make sure that when the partial is seated, it's not easily dislodged during chewing and it doesn't move during speech. Uh, but at the same time, we wanna make sure the patient can easily remove it and clean it. Um, you, as you guys know, partials are designed with major ridge laps and the patient has to get them out all the time to, uh, to keep their mouth healthy. Um, stability, and stability is a bit of a difficult thing with partial. 
Because with the Kennedy class three or four, we would expect that it shouldn't move. If we design it properly, it really shouldn't move from chewing. Um, but with class two and class one, there's going to be some movement because of tissue deflection. So what we want to do is we want to make sure that we're minimizing that movement, we're controlling the movement, and we're thinking about how it affects the underlying teeth. Support, we, we're putting a lot of load on the teeth with rests. So we want to make sure that we distribute the load both amongst a variety of teeth, and we want to make sure that, um, that the loads we're putting on the teeth are not excessive based on their uh, periodontal stability and and overall uh, morphology. We want to make sure that our denture bases are as large as possible, so we're getting some support from the soft tissues as well, and that we have adequate uh, adaptation. Comfort. Now, the reason we put this forth is because if we have retention stability and support going well, that's a big piece of comfort. But we also want to make sure that our partials are sitting primarily on stable tissues, that we don't uh, impinge on mobile tissues and create sore spots. Um, we want to look at anatomical areas that'll be sore and avoid those. And um, so comfort kind of becomes a modifier of the other three, I would say. And then aesthetics. I would say with partials, aesthetics are our biggest challenge. Uh, with metal partials, a lot of times we're going to have difficulty moving the clasps far enough distals where you don't see them at all. Um, or sometimes we can, if the person has a low lip line, sometimes we can hide the clasps apical enough to where we don't see it. You'll see there's some materials we can use that are a little bit less visible, and so those can help with aesthetics. Um, and uh, Sometimes we can see a transition between the, like here, for instance, between the plastic and the mouth that can be difficult to hide as well. Um, one of the challenges with aesthetics is you want to make sure that you under promise and over deliver. Um, a lot of partial problems that I've seen are cases where patients were expecting something to be invisible, and it's like, eh, it's hard to find an invisible partial. So it's better to say you'll probably see it and then let the patient be pleasantly surprised. And if they want a more aesthetic option, perfect time to talk about the fixed solutions, perhaps an implant-borne solution for them. Um, here's some general rules for partial design when you're thinking about your cases. Um, a smaller partial is better than a larger partial. Every part of the partial is going to capture food and uh, is going to present hygiene issues for the patient. So we want to make sure that we keep it as small as possible. Base adaptation is usually very important as well, especially in Kennedy class one and two, the, our base adaptation will help, um, will help keep our partials more stable. Um, we wanna make sure also that our partials are well-fitting because an ill-fitting partial is going to increase um, bone resorption, which isn't good. Um, use what's present and plan for the future. We want to make sure that we're doing the least modifications to the teeth that we can. So if we have great surfaces for guide planes, let's not grind down teeth that we don't have to. If we have areas that we can use for rest based on the occlusion, let's use those. Um, we do want to make sure our rests are out of occlusion, so we will need a millimeter and a half of space over them. That's really important. If you have a bunch of uh, unstable teeth, you want to make sure that your partial design allows them to be easily added to the partial as opposed to having to redo the whole case every time you need to add a tooth. And last but not least, it's best to design your occlusal scheme with group function because that'll help prevent uh, tipping loads and uh, keep our partials more stable. Because again, occlusal force is the thing we're kind of fighting against with these cases. When you're looking at your major connector, there's a few rules we want to apply. Um, we want our, uh, the superior border of our major connector to be more than three millimeters apical to the free gingival margin. And if we can't do that, on the, especially on the mandible, we'll want to use a lingual plate. Um, lingual plates are good if we're planning to lose uh, um, mandibular anterior teeth because we can add retention, especially with a metal partial. Um, 
Otherwise, we'll want to do a lingual bar for hygiene. Uh, we want to minimize our palatal coverage for best taste sensation. Um, we really only want to use full partial coverage with a Kennedy class one when there are less than six teeth present in the maxilla. Otherwise, our patients will best be, be best served with a palatal strap design, like you're seeing here. So with our retentive grids, this part of the partial that holds the um, <clears throat> Holds of plastic, we want to make sure that our maxillary grids extend over the two porosities. Um, our mandibular retentive grids uh, should end before the retromolar pads, and you're not seeing them here, but uh, our Kennedy class one and two cases should have a tissue stop. It doesn't really affect the final partial, but it's really important for processing. It helps make sure that the partial frame doesn't tip during processing. Um, guide planes. Guide planes are really important because you can get a lot of stability in the partial with good guide planes and they don't require clasping. Um, so they can help with our, our plan for making our partials more simple. We can also incorporate guide planes into our uh, minor connectors many times. So our guide planes should be parallel to the path of insertion. They should cover several axial surfaces. They should be directly opposed. When you when you have a situation like this where two guide planes oppose each other, then they provide quite a bit more stability. Um, we want to place them on several teeth and we want to cover a large surface area. The other thing that's hidden in this, if you notice, there's not a lot of space between the guide plane and the teeth. This is why you prepare your guide planes, because if there's a large gap uh, apically, of course, that'll collect fluid between them. Good. We need to keep a good eye on our occlusal clearance with all rests. One of the things you'll, you'll see with your laboratories, probably this is the greatest feedback you'll find, is we need more rest, more occlusal clearance on our rest. So when you're designing your cases, if you have edential spaces opposing a rest, so much the better, so there's room for it. Um, it's better to have a millimeter and a half of depth for your uh, partial rests. And it's better if it's a little bit deeper towards the center of the tooth, which helps locate it. And you want nice round internal line angles. Don't forget that if you cut a sharp internal line angle, partial will have a sharp area, and that in turn creates a stress point for potential failure. Um, you want to use cingulum rests on your canines. Um, in general, you don't want to put rests on your incisors. You can use incisal rests if you need to, but the teeth don't have, as you know, large roots, and so they're not real stable. And it's best not to put uh, rests on amalgam because they can tend to dislodge your amalgams. Um, the direct retainers, the clasps, are so important for partial. They're what give it its stability, essentially. Um, and a lot of the functions that we talked about that are so important are going to be uh, incorporated into the rest. Obviously, the, I mean, into the class. The rest here is what gives it its support. So we want to make sure that it's well designed and that it's on a tooth that is nice and stable and can support the load we're putting on it. Uh, reciprocity is real imp really important as well. It's easy to think of the, um, the active tip of the clasp and how that retains the case, but an active tip is only active relative to the bracing arm. So we want to make sure we have a good bracing arm design um, that will help allow the, uh, the clasp to work. Obviously, uh, the clasp needs to be positioned so that it's contributing to the stability of the partial. Um, other than guide planes, all the retention for your case is going to come from your clasp. So you want to make sure that you have a good design. Encirclement. Um, if, you, if you look at this, uh, we got about 210 degrees of encirclement here. In other words, from here all the way around to here, it needs to be more than 180 degrees. Because otherwise, if you had a retentive tip here and a bracing arm here, it's going to put distal force on the partial. And that kind of goes to our last point, which is that when a clasp design is done correctly and fully seated, it'll be passive. In other words, it's just sitting there on the tooth. You don't have a design, like I mentioned, where the, where the clasp is constantly trying to push the partial in another direction. Um, with your clasps, uh, if you do a cast metal clasp, you'll need a 0.01 undercut. In other words, the Undercut below this line of contour is 0 0.01, 0 0.02 for a rot wire. Um, 
different materials require different undercuts. So talk to your laboratory about that. And sometimes that is decides which teeth need to be classed because there are teeth that it's just not practical to create an undercut on. Um, only the retentive tip of the active arm should be into the undercut. The rest, the bracing arm and the other two thirds of the class should be above the height of contour. Uh, the bracing arm should be at least to the middle of the tooth occlusal gingivally like we talked about, but not in an undercut. And uh, no more than four class per arch. Again, the simpler, the better. Um, we'll talk about an acres clasp is probably the most common. It has retentive and bracing arms that originate from the rest. The rest can be on either side. It's very versatile. It has good bracing properties. It's sturdy. Um, if it's a metal partial or actually any kind of partial, it's going to have a ton of material display. So sometimes acres are best used in the posterior just because of the aesthetic challenges with them. A double embrasure clasp, sometimes called the double acres, is it gives you a tremendous amount of retention uh, in a fairly compact design. But again, there's a lot of uh, metal shown. A lot of times this will be on the away side from the uh, saddle on a Kennedy class two case. Uh, they're usually only used in molar areas. Uh, bar class. Bar class are really, really popular. Um, because they're so much less visible. They're really classified by the shape of the active arm of the bar. So you can see you got T-bar, L-bar, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I-bar and RPI is kind of a special design, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. But uh, really, the design of the arm has a lot to do with where the undercut is. Um, the one thing you have to watch out for with the bar class, a lot of patients are going to like these because they're uh, more aesthetic. But we wanna make sure we don't put them on cases where there's a large apical undercut because there'll be a gap between the bar clasp and the tooth that'll catch food. Um, and they're also, of course, you can't use them in areas with shallow vestibules. An RPI or an I-bar clasp is a, a special kind of clasp because it's always designed a certain way. RPI stands for rest plane and I bar. It always has a mesial rest. It always has a distal guide plane and it uses an I bar retentive arm. A lot of times you guys will see this in the anterior for aesthetics. And you might not have thought about this, but these are really the ideal class to be next to any dentulous area on a Kennedy class one or two. The reason is that as you can see, the partial is going to have a little bit of movement. That's just a fact of life with these. And so with your rest on the mesial, it allows the guide plane to move a little bit without um, compromising as much the stability as the rest of the case. Otherwise, if you use a distal rest and you patient bites down, it's going to basically move your, move your clasp arm quite a bit and tip the rest of your partial. As we know, stability is really important. So using these RPIs um, right next to the saddle areas on your class one and class two cases are going to make a huge difference. Um, and a lot of laboratories don't really know about this. This is where your expertise as a clinician comes in, and you can help coach your labs to get your patients the best result. Um, again, can't be used with severe undercuts or with shallow vestibules. Um, and I swear there's every, I've been doing this a long time. I'll still sometimes see class that I've never seen before. There's a lot of designs out there, but these basic ones will get you, definitely get you started and will address most clinical situations you'll run into. Uh, fulcrum align. Um, one of the things you want to keep in mind is that because of occlusal force, partials are going to want to rotate. You need to know where this point is because when you're designing your partial, you want to try to resist that movement. So, for instance, um, with the first case here, you'd use double eye bars because it, it, you can't stop the movement, but you can at least uh, prevent, uh, minimize it. And you might also want to do indirect retainers on your cuspids. Um, with the case in E here, 
Um, this case could be very stable. You might even want to do either an acres or an embrasure clasp on both sides of the posterior. And then um, you could get uh, indirect retention in the anterior or perhaps a clear clasp, something like that. But as you're working with the case, you need to decide, A, how much of the rotation can I control? And B, have I, have I gotten the most control with the least amount of component tool? Um, with the Kennedy class one, you're always going to want to do a lingual bar if you can, or an AP strap for the maxilla. And uh, you're only going to be doing a full palatal plate if the patient doesn't have any posterior teeth because you need the extra strength because of the amount of occlusal force. Um, always you'll want to use your RPI clasps. Um, RPA clasps are design sensitive. You need to make sure you've cut a nice rest on the mesial and a distal guide plane. So um, a little bit of a uh, little bit of extra time on that helps. Uh, you can use indirect retainers on the cuspids if the posterior teeth are present, but uh, you might need to do a palatal plate for stability if there are no posterior teeth. And these can be good cases for potentially resilient attachments like a locator. Um, it's going to be difficult to hide the clasps all the way, and if you put a couple locators strategically. You can uh, you can make the case much more stable. You can even use mini mini implants with a ball attachment for a less expensive solution. Uh, keep in mind if you're placing implants, it's called an all on four, and you've placed at least two. So make sure you place them for uh, so your patient can get the most utility out of them. So again, on a Kennedy class two, you want to do a lingual bar and palatal strap as much as possible. You want to get the denture base as large as possible. Again, the best way to control the rotation on this is to um, is to get good adaptation with your denture base. So when the patient bites down, it doesn't the partial doesn't move as much. Um, RPI is great for the edentulous er, next to the edentulous area, and you can do an anchors or a double embrasure on the opposite side, like we talked about, um, and then. Keep in mind that you want your indirect retention. You draw your fulcrum line, and then as far as possible, you'll put an indirect uh, retainer or rest, in other words, to prevent that rotation often a single rest on a cuspid because you have, um, the, you know, the tooth is so strong and can bear it. Um, with a Kennedy class three, um, you'll want to keep the partial um, as small as you can. Um, An acres clasp on either side of the edentulous area can give you really nice stability. Um, obviously, sometimes the anterior one, you can't do that. So you'll want to um, get something that's as aesthetic as possible. Again, talk with your patient ahead of time about what you can and can't do. And make sure that the patient understands the aesthetic compromises sometimes intrinsic to using a partial. Um, if it's a large edentulous space, you're again you're going to want to there's going to be buckle the lingual tipping forces and you'll want an acres or perhaps an embrasure clasp um, on the contralateral side to prevent that tipping if you're only missing one or two teeth you might want to consider a unilateral partial like you see in the picture that just basically works like a removable bridge patients really like it um, it's more for appearance than for chewing so again you need to look at what the patient wants to use it for but it can be an affordable solution either as a permanent solution for patients who want that or it can even be a nice temporary solution if you're placing it in so when you're getting into a kennedy class four again lingual bar ap strap you're i'm sure you're seeing a theme there uh you you'll want a well-adapted denture base but again You'll be, especially in the mandible, there's a lot of mobile tissues. We want to make sure we don't overextend into those areas. Um, if, if you can aesthetically get an acres clasp in the area adjacent to the edential spaces, that'll make it more stable. You can see how we use, this case actually has six clasps, which is probably a little bit of overkill. We could probably do with just um, acres on both first molars, and that'd be very stable. Again, with our theme of making our partial as small as possible if we don't extend towards the distal so much the better. Um, there's 
going to be a certain amount of tipping force. So by moving those, the second set of clasps as distal as possible, they have a real, they have more um, mechanical advantage against the tipping. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the different materials that are available. Um, I feel like when we're talking about partial dentures, there's two basic options. One is partials that are supported by teeth and the other is those that are supported by tissue. Many of the current more aesthetic materials aren't uh, strong enough to make rests so they receive all their support from soft tissue. Now, you guys all know that externally loaded bone resorbs while internally loaded bone is retained, um, internally loaded bone by a tooth or an implant. So when we're choosing a mu mucostatic partial, we want to keep that in mind and talk to our patient about the potential accelerated uh, bone loss that can occur and also um, that we uh, That we, um, that we avoid these kind of partials on class one and class two cases because they, um, because they have so much movement in them already. Um, we also wanna make sure that our patients know that, um, that getting these, that's what I was gonna say before, getting these relined is really important because good adaptation helps slow down the rate of uh, hard and soft tissue loss. Um, some of the materials are more rigid than others. Uh, with large free end cases, a more rigid prosthetic will probably be more, um, more comfortable for the patient. So I think most of us, when we think of a partial, at least I guess I can speak for myself, I think of this, a, a metal frame partial with a chrome cobalt frame in it. These have been around since 1929. Um, recently, the EU uh, has uh, limited the use of cobalt-based alloys, but um, I've seen uh, there's a meta study done in 2022 of in vitro and in vivo studies from 1995 um, showed that while chrome cobalt is not quite as compatible biocompatible as titanium is much more compatible than nickel. This result surveyed also showed no cytotoxic city drain uh, in vitro testing. Uh, metal partials, they're not just an old solution, they're still a good solution. They're strong, so we can make the framework relatively thin. Um, it's metal is intrinsically ductile, so it allows us to make our flexible clasp arms and our rigid support from essentially the same material, just um, controlling it by how thick or thin we make the materials. Um, we can use rests which seem like a small part of the partial, but they're the part that make a case tooth borne and give it so much more stability. Uh, it's a proven workflow and it has both analog and digital workflows, but they're not the most aesthetic thing in the world. And some people wanna avoid metal. Um, I would say that in general situations, this is still gonna be your go-to prosthetic in 2023 a hundred years after it's been introduced. Um, and a lot of times this is the standard. So like people will ask, how does this compare to a metal partial? Uh, all acrylic partials, sometimes called treatment partials, flippers, they're usually the most economical and they're not intended for long-term use. These are mucostatic and uh, you can use a variety of different uh, clasps. Um, these could be 3D printed, but I think most, and we'll probably see that, but right now they're mostly made by heat processing, uh, injection, or cold curing. Flexible partials are a newer office offer in the marketplace. Valplast first came out in 1960. Um, there's a newer product called Duraflex out there as well. Um, these cannot be, they're very difficult to repair, let's say that. So you want to kind of make sure the person's in a stable situation before you get them. They, the clasps themselves are very translucent. So as long as the height of contour is low on the tooth, you can make a nearly invisible partial. And these do tend to be very comfortable for the patient. The one thing to keep in mind about this is that 
these partials, everything flexes. So not just the clasp, the denture base as well. So with this particular partial, with the patient biting on it, the uh, pusal surface would flex. Um, one thing we want to keep in mind with these is that they're susceptible to damage from commercial denture cleansers. So you're going to want your patients to just brush them with uh, warm soapy water and store them dry. Uh, there are some nascent printing technologies for these that haven't really hit the marketplace yet and some milling as well. But again, I think most of these are being injection form today. Um, you can look at the cases and say, wow, what if I could put the clasp of flexible with the rigidity of a metal? And you can. Uh, sometimes these are called combination partials, Virginia partials. There's a lot of nice names for these. These can be a great option for your patient because you get the stability and smaller size of a metal frame and the aesthetics and comfort of the clasp. One thing to keep in mind with these is that you can't try the clasping in till the very end of the case. So when you get the partial for these to try it in, you'll just have the teeth held in wax, but you won't have any clasps on it. Um, these can also be a good option if you have a patient who's allergic to acrylic because the resin on these is not acrylic. It's either um, nylon with valplast or polypropylene with Duraflex. Um, and with, Dur with um, both valplast and Duraflex, make sure you talk to your lab about what they like. Just like you guys have materials that work best in your hands, your labs have materials that work better for them and you can get the best results by letting your lab use materials that they work well with. ClearFrame is a newer product that's pretty cool. It's, um, it's nearly as transparent as window glass and it's more rigid than Valplast. So you can make clasp, breasts, and guide planes. Um, it does need to be a little bit thicker than a metal frame. So this is probably the only metal-free option. Well, I guess there's Peak and Pecton. We can talk about that. But um, this is probably the best metal-free option for a tooth-borne case. So um, these also use standard acrylic for the teeth and the saddle. So you can replace broken teeth. You can repair the saddle. The frame itself cannot be repaired, but the saddles can. So you can realign it. Um, this material can be milled or injected, so we, we can talk about that. Um, there are some advanced polymers, pectin, peak, and PAEK. Voltaire AKP is an example of this. Um, a lot of labs have tried these. The labs that I've worked with tried them and found them a little bit frustrating and kind of under-delivering on aesthetics for the patient. So um, I think the clear frame is the one that I've seen the most uh, widely used today. Um, partial workflows vary so much that it's um, it's hard to do my little standard set of workflow things. So let's just talk about impressions. Um, I would encourage your lab to articulate partial cases. Some labs do, some labs don't, but it can save you a ton of adjusting on the rest or the opposing teeth if you decide ahead of time where your rests are going to be. You're going to want to use polyether or PVS and a custom tray if, um, if you don't have good adaptation with a stock tray. One thing to keep in mind with these is that your partials are going to fit very precisely like a bridge. So you need to take a crown of bridge for the impression. Um, a little more time spent with the impression is going to save you a ton of adjustments at the end. iOS are great for these. Um, you can capture the bite at the first appointment, avoiding a bite block. Uh, appointment sometimes when you use your iOS. One thing you need to keep in mind is how well your iOS captures tissue as opposed to how much tissue you need. You may need to turn off uh, AI trimming to, uh, to get this to work properly. Um, so, and you'll sometimes have a, you'll usually have a frame try-in if the partial has a frame. Otherwise, if you're doing like a treatment partial or a Valplast or a Duraflex. A lot of times you'll just go bite block. You might do a setup if there's anterior teeth, but otherwise you might go straight to deliver. Um, another thing you can talk with your lab about is whether you would prefer to have teeth set on the frame, or if you prefer to just try in the frame by itself so that you can uh, visualize the fit a little bit better. That's all I have. I have a little slide here for um, 
that shows some of the CDT codes that you can use for partial dentures. Um, and thanks for uh, joining in today. I hope you have a great day.